Picture this, there's this fictitious system that exists with the people with the least amount of money. The poorest people in society pay the largest amount of money to the government voluntarily. Why are they willing to give up to 5% of their annual income to this cause? Because they're incentivized with the chance to win a life-changing prize, millions of dollars. See, this system takes advantage of people's vulnerabilities, and what's more of a weak spot than giving someone with little money a chance to win a lot of money? And of course, you don't pitch it as something that they're paying money towards. No, you pitch it as a small amount, just $2 at a time for a chance to win, say, $100 million. That sounds worth it, right? And you forget about the fact that they could actually end up spending thousands of dollars and have $0 won. Instead, it's just $2 versus $100 million. How could you not just try it and give it a shot? And it's pitched on billboards that say this could be your ticket out, even though your odds of winning are actually so low that you're more likely to be killed by lightning or a vending machine falling on you, which are both pretty unlikely, by the way. If you haven't caught on by now, this isn't a fictitious system. It's very real and it's called the lottery. Now, most of the time when we think about the lottery, it's wishful thinking. Either it's a conversation about what we would do with the money if we won, or we're seeing these stories and ads that make it seem really positive positive. It's just a fun game that gives you a chance of winning something amazing, and everyone does it, so what's the problem? And seriously, a lot of people play the lottery. And it's not just people with a lower income. See, they're hit with the ads about dreaming big, and so is the middle class, but they're also reminded about how the lottery money goes towards helping people, like funding public schools and other public services. In reality, the lottery can be fun and harmless in theory, but it also very specifically targets people who have less money. And in turn, those people pay a disproportionately high amount of their money towards buying tickets, which are the exact same price for everyone who plays. $2 might sound low across the board, but it'll add up a lot quicker for someone making $25,000 per year versus even, say, $75,000 per year. And on top of that, the money that the lottery says is going towards public education or other services isn't really doing that in the way you'd picture, and we'll get into that. But first, how did this entire lottery thing become such a big part of our society and daily lives? The lottery's been around for a really long time. Think back to over 2,000 years ago, where a game called Kino was created and played during the Han Dynasty in China. This lottery-style game was used to raise money for the military and other public projects, like building parts of the Great Wall of China. Then, still in BCE times, lottery tickets were used by the Roman Empire to raise money to repair the city of Rome, and winners were given prizes. And they kept popping up as time went on, including the first state lottery in England in 1567, where Queen Elizabeth I created a lottery to, again, raise money for public work and it ended up being something that they continued to use. It was then brought by the English to the United States, where lotteries were used to fund colonial infrastructure, like the Jamestown Colony of Virginia in the 1600s, and also a bunch of Ivy League colleges, like Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Then in 1878, lotteries were suddenly banned across the US. It was considered a vice or something bad, so no one was allowed to run them, except they did still exist illegally across the country. In Harlem, New York, a lottery game called The Numbers was thriving throughout the 1900s, making between $800 million and $1.5 billion a year, until the legalized industry came back and brought all of that to a halt. In 1964, the first state-run lottery started in New Hampshire, and by the 1980s, multiple states had banned together to create multi-state lotteries in order to get those really big cash prizes to entice people. Lotteries started in Canada around the same time, in Quebec in the 1970s, to raise money for the Montreal Olympic Games. Now, pretty much every state in the US and every province in Canada runs a lottery. And to think that lotteries have become so popular and that they've only really gained this popularity in the last four or so decades is pretty crazy. So how did they blow up to the point where all of a sudden over half of Americans and over half the people in Ontario play the lottery every single year? Well, first, we need to cover the incentive for why the government-run lottery started popping up in North America. Now, in general, it was to raise money for specific public services, like how the first lottery in Canada was used to raise money for the Olympics to be hosted in Montreal. But the biggest reason is because it just generally generates a lot of revenue for the government to use, and people are pretty happy to pay this money because there's a chance that it could be really, really worth it. It's kind of like how people hate paying for taxes because they don't see the direct benefit that they're getting from them, but they don't mind paying for lottery tickets because they know the benefit that they could potentially get. And something that I find the most crazy is that more people buy lottery tickets when the prize amounts are really high, even though that means that your chances of winning are much worse. And once again, that's why two of the biggest lotteries changed up how the system works, and that's why we've been seeing all these crazy high prize amounts over the past few years. Here's how the lottery works. In general, a lottery is any type of gambling operated by the state or province province in Canada, so from scratch tickets to draws, and two of the biggest ones in the US that Canadians can play too are Powerball and
of Mega Millions. Originally, different states sold either Powerball or Mega Millions tickets until 2009 when they signed an agreement to have both sold pretty much everywhere, helping to boost ticket sales and ultimately driving up those prize amounts. Then they continued to make changes that allowed for bigger prizes, like resetting the jackpot amounts to a minimum of $20 million, handing out prizes less often, and doubling ticket prices from $1 to $2. And then the really big change that really raised the stakes was making changes to the rules. Powerball went from 59 to 69 white balls, and from 35 to 26 red balls. This made the odds of winning even lower, going from 1 in 175 million to 1 in 292 million. And Mega Millions was similar, like that, the chances of you winning that lottery are 1 in 302 million. To give some perspective on that, that's about the population of the US. So that's like one person versus the entire United States. And again, even though the odds are lower, ticket sales went up. And even though the grand prizes are even more massive, like the 18 year old from Canada who just won $48 million her first time ever playing, or the $2 billion prize from last year in the US, the government gets way more money than the players do. Here's the thing, those prizes might sound absolutely massive, but for most people, the lottery ends up being a waste of money. And the people who are wasting the most money are the ones who can least afford it. Households making less than $12,400 per year spend an average of 5% of their total income on lottery tickets. And over a quarter of households making $30,000 buy lottery tickets every single week, spending an average of $412 per year. Now this is disproportionately higher than the average of $105 spent per year for households making over $75,000. If that sounds confusing, it's not when you think about how lottery ads specifically target lower income groups. There was this study done by the National Gambling Impact Study Commission in the late 1990s that showed that some states target low income groups by specifically timing lottery ads to line up with the times that people get their government benefits, paydays, social security payments, basically just trying to make it as easy as possible for that money to go straight towards buying tickets. And retailers who sell lottery tickets are also more highly concentrated in lower income areas. Couple all of this convenience with the fact that ads say things like, this is your ticket out and just believe, people truly think that winning the lottery is their only chance to make a lot of money in their lives. Advertising and accessibility to people with lower incomes has been proven to have a big impact before, like the toilet paper study. People living in poverty actually spent 5.9% more on toilet paper because of reasons like inability to buy in bulk because of the upfront costs, lack of access to large or wholesale stores, or having to take public transportation. Point is, there aren't as many options for what to buy and how. On top of all of this, the advertising can be predatory to everyone because there's not many disclaimers about the low chance of winning. In the US, states are exempt from the truth in advertising laws, which are in place to keep businesses from making misleading claims to their customers about their product's benefits. Now, in Canada, we've also seen a big lack of regulation across sports betting ads specifically, and we've really seen how targeted those ads can be. The other benefits that the government has is the fact that it has a monopoly over the lottery system and it makes a lot of money. Like, I didn't know this, but originally in the US, the lottery was actually pitched as a way to fund public education. But only a portion of that money actually goes there. Like we found this breakdown of where a $1 New York City lottery ticket, where the money from that actually goes, and it looks like this. 16 cents goes to the retailer, and then 84 cents goes to the lottery, who then breaks that down into one cent for advertising, one cent for operating expenses, 34 cents for public education, and then 48 cents is to be paid out in prizes. And again, that's split up into taxes and the winner's actual portion of 31 cents. Now, when it comes to that 34 cents that goes towards public education, there's definitely more to that. Like there's research that's shown that even if money does go from the lottery to public education, the original budget for education gets cut down so no additional money actually goes there. Think of it this way. If a state is gonna spend $100 on public education, but they get an additional $10 from the lottery, then in theory, they would have $110 to put towards schools. Amazing. But that's not what they do. Instead, what they do is they take that additional $10 and they include it in that original $100 budget. So what they now can do is they can reallocate that additional $10 from the budget that they cut to something else. So really, public education isn't really getting any more money. This is another reason why lower income people are being preyed on by the industry, because it's essentially a tax and one where people with less money are putting a higher percentage of their income towards. This is what's called a regressive tax. Think of it like this. 
Lottery tickets are the same price no matter where you go, whether you make $10,000, $50,000, or $150,000. And if this product is gonna be treated as a tax, where the government gets the money to spend as they choose, then I think lower income people are paying way more than their fair share percentage wise. And the advertising makes it really hard for them to realize that. So the lottery is a massive industry that makes a lot of money and it's only growing. And I think it's really important that we understand how it really works. So if you still wanna play, you can, but be informed and make sure you know that your chances of winning are much lower than your chances of you hitting your other goals. So make sure you go for those too. If you wanna learn more about how our regular taxes work, check out this video next on everything you need to know. And as usual, guys, we'll see you next week. You guys already know the vibes and let's go.